Well, hey there, and welcome to Understanding the Bible. This week we are reading Revelation 20, and it's all about the millennium. This Friday, I'm going to be doing a detailed breakdown of three different views for interpreting it. We're going to shift away from our four views, and it's like um, it gets a little complicated, so we'll see you then. But right now, we're just going to be doing a reading straight through, and I'm just going to be looking at just looking in the passage to see if there's any indication of how to interpret it or how different people might come to different conclusions. All right, so let's dive in to Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. This, this word right here then it seems like it would be telling us something chronologically so let's see we're coming out of 19 we just had all of this going on we saw the coming of christ we saw the doom of the beast and the false prophet and so this is coming after that but there are two ways to interpret the word then one is that this could be chronological, so that this is the next thing that happens in a series of events. So it's telling us the chronology of what's going to happen. The other way to interpret it is that it's also chronological, but not of the events themselves that are being prophesied, but rather of the vision. So if you have a vision that's sending you stuff out of order, then you're telling the order that you saw the vision, but that doesn't give you an indication of when these events are going to happen necessarily. So those are the two ways to interpret this then. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and great change in his hand, and a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan. So we've seen um, about the devil already some, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So we see several ideas here. One is the binding of Satan and throwing him into the abyss. This is an abyss that we've seen some reference to earlier in Revelation. Do I have a footnote here? What happens if we just search for abyss? All right, so Revelation 9 is what I was thinking about here. We have these other references in Luke and Romans, so I'm going to go ahead and read those while I'm here. But Revelation 9 was the passage I was talking about. So we had seen that, the fifth trumpet and the shaft of the abyss. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key to that shaft of the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and smoke ascended out of the shaft like smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened out from the smoke of the shaft. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth. So we already seen that the abyss has been opened during this tribulation time, and then the devil is being sent there, in Revelation um, 20, where we are today. What, what's this reference in Luke? Let's look at it. So this is Luke 8. What's our context here? All right, so this is a familiar story. Um, Jesus has arrived, and there's this demon-possessed man named Legion, and the demon's ask Jesus not to send them into the abyss. So this is the same word that we're seeing in Revelation. So instead, Jesus sends them into a herd of pigs. And they rushed in the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. This is a kind of mysterious passage, right? Like, why, um, why is Jesus doing this? Why is he sending them into the pigs? Is this better for them? What happens to the demons when they're in the pigs? There's a lot of questions raised here, but we have this idea that even the demons are asking, don't send us into the abyss. And that is exactly where Satan is being sent here, that he's being bound. So this is showing that he's limited, um, that he's... Um, He's restrained, and he's sent into the abyss, and it's being shut, and it's sealed over him. So this is really showing God's sovereignty, God's power over the devil. And look how easy it was. And he took hold of the dragon. This is like the whole fight. This is the whole thing. It's just just like that it happens. There's no uh, tension in this. The tension is, for the believers, what it's going to be like to live in the midst of tribulation and trials. But the actual... Um, conflict between God and the devil 
is not one that the devil has real authority over. He's allowed some temporary authority, but as soon as God revokes that, it's over. There's there's not even a um, a whole sentence on the subject. Then the next idea we see here is this idea of the millennium. It says, until the thousand years were completed. And this is really what we're asking about in the section. What is this thousand years? We use the term millennium, which just means a thousand years. Um, It's just the same idea. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. All right, so this is actually giving us a little bit of chronology, right? This is telling us that this is after all of those other events. Even if there is a, um, a question on chronology here, this is certainly happening after the event with the beast and the marks on their heads had been completed. So this is telling us that this is following that. And they came to life. What's going on here with this thousand years is the reign of these martyrs along with Christ. And um, what exactly does that look like? What about other believers who were not alive during this time of tribulation, but who believed in Christ? It's not telling us a lot about that right here. So this is the time period of those who are um, have been through the persecution and have died, maybe as martyrs. And they are coming back to life and reigning with Christ during this time of a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So we have this picture that there is something distinct and different of those who suffer for Christ. That martyrs are being given a special reward by God for their faithfulness. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection over those the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So this is reiterating that. And there's this cryptic line here, the second death has no power, um, presumably about maybe judgment coming. So this is a kind of surprising line. Okay, so we saw that in Revelation 2. 2014, so that's going to be down here. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. There we go. So we have it later in the passage. All right, moving on to verse 7. And here we have something that is confusing um, just from a kind of story point of view. What is happening here? Um, Satan is being freed again. So this seems like this is the end. Satan has been defeated. We have the reign of Christ with the martyrs. Um, And then a thousand years later, the rest of the believers are going to be raised again as well, it appears. But Satan is going to be uh, released one more time, and there's going to be some armies present. So let's read this. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations, which are the which are at the four corners of the earth. So here we have this idea, and it's not really clear what has been happening. During this time, is there like kind of perfect peace and harmony for a thousand years? Are people still living with sin? Is Satan's influence and sin gone? Are they living normally but with less of the influence of Satan and just natural human sin is still present? It's a little unclear, but we've got this passage where Satan comes back and he deceives the nation again. And then we're going to see that these two groups here, Gog and Magog, gather them together for the war. The number of them, so this is another war, right? Like we've seen several wars in Revelation. Gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore, so for very many. And they came up the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and the fire came down from heaven and devoured them. We have a little bit more picture of this war than we've seen that they're they're coming up and it looks like there's going to be a battle and then a fire from heaven is coming down and destroying them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast 
and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, so one question I have here is, what is the difference between the lake of fire and the abyss? What is the difference between those two things? That's something I could spend some time looking at. They seem like they would both be um, images or pictures for a very similar thing. And so um, I'm curious what that difference is. And here we have our final, final kind of judgment of the devil. And I'm curious why we do have it the second time, right? Like, why does it not end up here? It's it's such a short element. There's very little drama in it. We have raining, and then we have a quick surprise kind of rebellion out of nowhere that's quickly put down, and then God's ultimate judgment. And so just reading through it, it's... um. It's a bit confusing. One way of looking at it is it's it's kind of taking a big picture summary of stuff that we've seen earlier in Revelation. Another way of looking at it is that the readers of Le- Revelation need this information in the first chapters more, that it's really written for the people in the midst of tribulation, and that's going to be helpful to them. And then they just know when all of that's over, these things are going to happen as well. But the, the section with all of the content, the first section— is the part that applies more to the readers of Revelation. And that could make sense. We have this happening, that the reign of Christ is taking place. So during this time, um, there's going to be not just merely relying on Scripture that we have, we're going to see a, a new reign that would give new information in addressing maybe this coming rebellion that we don't have in Revelation. These are just kind of like spitballing some ideas as I read through it, right? Like these are not final thoughts. I'm just, as I read through this, I'm trying to make sense. Why is this different? Why is this doing something unexpected? You know, what, what is here that, um, that would explain to me some of this? And then I'm going to also, of course, spend time reading commentaries and reading other information and then kind of weighing that information out. That would be the process of doing a Bible study like this. And so we have this conclusion. We have Satan is now doomed. He is punished. He's thrown into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet. So at this point, all of those forces of evil from Revelation that we've read about so far are in the lake of fire. They faced their judgment. But what's coming after that? Is the judgment the end or is there more? Let's keep reading. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. All right, so let's take a look at what books we have. So there were books opened, and another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. And so it seems that there is a judgment that that there are maybe two separate books. There's one that's just a a fair, accurate judgment of the people's lives. That, That as we're living life, that what we're doing is not unforgotten, that it's written down, that it's recorded, and that we're going to be held to account on it. But notice that there is a uh, another book there that's very important, the Book of Life. And this seems to be different than these books that are outlining the histories and lives of people, right? So one has their deeds, and the other one has the Book of Life. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And so here we have this kind of this complete idea that everyone who died, even those who died at sea where they might have been thought lost, they're all coming back to life. And they were judged, each of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Here we have death and Hades themselves being thrown into the lake of fire in judgment. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And here we go. That answers um, this question, right? The lake of fire is the second death. All right, so we change that to blue since we have an answer. And if anybody's name was not found written in the book of life, He was thrown into the lake of fire. 
This is a really interesting picture because we have two separate books, and on one hand, everybody is being judged by their deeds. But interestingly, it is the book of life that ultimately is marking people as judging to be worthy. It's by being in the book of life that they receive this life, this eternal life. And so the life that we see avoiding this judgment is all found by being written in the book of life. And then next week, we're going to see what comes next with this new heaven and new earth. But for now, we have this chapter 20. And this question that has puzzled Christians for many, many years, how do we interpret this? And it doesn't fit cleanly into any of the four views that we've been studying. In fact, each of the four views could have different interpretations of this passage. So this Friday, I'm going to be breaking it down. I'm going to be sharing you the the major ways to interpret it. um, Premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. And we'll see uh, what those terms mean and how each position is defended from within the text. 